has been pushed. We are live streaming. It is value after hours. It's 10.30 a.m. on the West Coast, 1.30 p.m. on the East Coast. Joined, as always, by Bill Brewster and Jake Taylor. Jake's uh, in the Witness Protection Program on an island in the Pacific. Yeah. What's happening, fellas? 7.30 a.m. here, so you're lucky to get me. <laughs> is it Dang, really? that's early. Yeah, that's an early, early kickoff. Are you the first one up, or is everybody still on continental time? Yeah, everyone's still pretty West Coast time, so it's the kids are up early. But the good news is we all go to bed early, too, so it works out. I actually like it. It's kind of my preferred schedule. <laughs> it's one of the... Uh, yeah, I, I like it because you get to see the dawn when you're in Hawaii. Yeah. Take the family down, watch the sun come up. It's kind of cool. Wife and I went for a little walk this morning with morning coffee, watch the sunrise. Oh, that's there nice. you go. That's very nice. Yeah. Very relaxing. Let's win some win some points there. <laughs> we should do this a week at home. No, we shouldn't. Nah, that's okay. I'm just going to get on Twitter instead. <laughs> that's right. I'll get angry. Yeah, get all angry to start the morning. This 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 market is uh, is testing the patience. It's going to be. Uh, I, I I've been like you know I'm my my optimistic take is that the we're in this we're in this mega bear and it started when Arc kind of fell over in February last year. But you know I posted on Twitter that's not a very popular view on Twitter. I got everybody arguing that it only started in this year, and I'm like the implications for that are that you know we're very very early on and we got a long long way to go. Sometimes you have to go down to go up. Always, always. Carve that it's on a plan bottom. Plan to bottom, as I always said. Yeah, that's what I used to do in training. What's that? I'd just get really drunk and tell myself that was my low. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing, nothing, nowhere to go but up. Oh, man. Uh What's uh, what's on the what's on the agenda for today, JT? I, I've got a fun one prepared on uh, Ed Thorpe, who's one of my one of my favorites. So we'll we'll get into some Ed Thorpe uh, trivia. <laughs> Morningstar guys- sees lots of cheap stocks, so there's that. Yeah, that wide moat list that yeah. uh, got to it. Yeah, that was interesting. There's some good oh, stuff yeah? in there. All right, I've got a Assuming brand. They know what they're doing. Yeah, we should talk about that a little bit. I got a Brandis uh, Institute article. Is the valley run over? Because we can't have nice things. It's been going for all of two like months week. or something. Yeah. And then they've it's got, so uh, yeah, I don't know why everybody keeps on asking, like, has it started? Is it over? But here we are. There, there are three reasons why they think that it's only just begun and uh i'll be discussing those only just begun. making my devotions to the value gods i mean that's is right. it over that's uh that's a rude thing to ask already oh my god it's, everybody's so scared of it we've got scotland in the house london nashville north korea nice julius caesar in north korea yeah it can't be over until everyone thinks it's it can't yeah end. it's not over until everybody's a value investor yeah we need to get all those casual sideliners like we were in 2006 <laughs> yeah S- samson's got the better got the better question has it started yeah i think that's the real question yeah good point um shall i kick it off do you want me to do yes please is the value run over sure <laughs> so brandis uh they they traced the beginning of it to pfizer monday they're calling it in november 2020 i guess that was when the jabs came out and the market bounced and I see there are three reasons why it's not over uh, because value tends to work at the beginning of an economic recovery. I uh, have to think about that one a little bit. Um, inflation is good for value and value spreads are still really wide. So the economic recovery one, uh, well, I guess we're going to be debating that a little bit. I don't, like maybe we're relative to where we were in the middle of the, the pandemic, but it doesn't look very recoverish to me at the moment kind of tail end of a it's not tail end of a ball i don't know what we are at the moment depths of the heading down probably uh the just looking for a green shoot yeah green shoots yeah i remember those just a green shoot yeah this, I, yeah no green shoots but the, i think the more interesting one is the impact <laughs> of inflation so they they sit they, they do this 
quintile, most expensive quintile minus the minus the most undervalued quintile. That's the twenty percent of the market quintile is fit, the market divided into fifths, and they track it against an, uh, consumer price index year over year, and that that sort of long short of value minus growth has tracked inflation pretty well. So it seems that in periods of high inflation, value does well. And they've got some reasons for the for the correlation. Um, financials tend to be in value. They're the largest component of the value indexes. They're saying that uh, they do a little bit better in periods of inflation. What's uh, the total return for both in periods of refl- inflation? Well, they, have, they don't have the, the total return. They've got... Um, they look one is at less shitty. 12, tw- uh, 12 inflationary periods since 1940. And they say that um, say value, that. Okay. value was um, positive in 83% of them. Growth was positive in 75% of them. So there's outperformed the S&P 500 value 92% of the time, growth 50% of the time. Average return for value 9.2% growth 2.6% and then they further divide it into large and small and so on. So the, de- the, the, the stagflation um, by decade, 1920s, 1940s, value stocks were mostly positive through those uh, at a reasonably good clip, mostly outperforming GDP. I don't know if it's a, if it is in fact inflationary, that might be good, but I don't know about the other points The I don't know if we're like economic recovery. That's, that's a long bow here. Yeah, maybe. Not, I don't know. I don't think not so. Having that. <laughs> Would not be my guess going into a tightening cycle. Yeah. I feel like we're dipping here a little bit more than I think we're like, I, I've said this for the last few weeks, but I think we find out that we've been in a recession for six months in about six months. And they'll say, yeah, we'll backdate it for a year. So We've been in inflation for a year, but we don't find out for another six months. And we all knew it all along. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the thing that bothers me is the Fed looks at those numbers and they're like, there's no, there's, no, there's no problem. There's no recession. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Well, I don't know that that's really what they're saying. What are they saying? I think they're saying uh, the wage inflation is a bigger issue right now than, than whatever risk to the economy there is. But I mean, obviously, once the... Uh, once the firings roll off, then uh, maybe maybe the balancing act changes. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that argument. I mean, they're so- they're terrified of a wage inflation spiral because the then you can't will stop be getting inflation. Too much money to pay for. Yeah, the God food forbid. And you know. Yeah, God forbid people should actually make enough to you know the, where the uh, where labor actually wins for a little bit. Yeah. I just don't see how wage inflation is outpacing uh, CPI at the moment. It looks to me like wage inflation is well below CPI, which means that people on a purchasing power basis are getting poorer. The wage inflation spiral. Yeah, I just don't know how sticky they think CPI is. I mean, you're not managing for one year, nor should you. The Fed? Yeah. Oh, I thought they were just taking it a day at a time. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, I, I I don't want policymakers to manage for what's going on today. So I I think if they had a a longer view, like I'd be I would be hopeful that they have a longer view. That's going to require a lot of hope. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they got us through twenty twenty. Okay, now you got to pump the brakes. Unfortunately, after every good night out, you get a hangover. So. I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I do wish Putin didn't bomb a mall at yesterday. That wasn't great. Doesn't seem like an incrementally positive development for the commodity po- complex. Uh, mm-hmm. I, mean, so. I knew malls were dead money, but I didn't realize that was why. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Too soon. Yeah. But I'm yes. glad it was you and not me. Ooh, crickets. Ouch. Yeah, it will, I'm, it'll be interesting to see how... Can they get rates up enough? I don't know. Who knows? But, I mean, just as you sort of, like, noodle through some of these dynamics of the interest expense for federal debt uh, 
at a higher level and it rolls off and we have to refinance it, who, number one, who's going to, who's ponying up to buy these treasuries again? Um, and then number two, at what price will they buy buying these? And if it's just the Fed buying them, then I don't know. How do you ever get inflation under control then? Yeah, I think I think the, there's a, the problem that we were discussing before we came on is that there's a there's an issue for the federal government if interest rates get too high, and that interest rates need to be like the the point at which interest rates are ahead of inflation seems to be the point at which the federal government runs out of money. So that seems to say that's 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 not possible. That's not tenable. So we're going to be keeping rates below the rate of inflation, which means that it's hard to get inflation under control. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, can... Brandis Institute brought out the thing that says that value does well in an inflation. So for purely selfish reasons, that might be okay for us. Yeah. Bad if you're. I don't uh, think it's a good outcome. Bad if you eat food or bad eat if you eat food, energy yeah. to, or drive your car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that housing um, is now more expensive than it has ever been um, relative to disposable incomes. Yeah. Okay. It's ten times today, which is which. That's that's high. Yeah, that's that be because of high prices and then high interest expense now, or higher. High prices and lo- and and not a great deal of disposable income. I'm guessing, because that's being eaten away by inflation. It seemed to suggest that there's probably something nasty coming for the property market too. Nah, 2020 <laughs> June 20. I don't think there is. I I think I think that's a flawed conclusion. Hmm. Uh. I bet a fair amount on it too, so I hope I'm right. Um, let me see something. There's just there's no there's no housing supply out there. So I mean, I, I get yeah, I guess I guess prices could crash in some theoretical way, but I don't. The thing think is that so. there's always a lack of supply at the top and an abundance of supply at the bottom. That's just what happens. Yeah, but you got, I mean, you don't have credit issues. I mean, what, what's going to force the liquidation cycle? Loss of, like, okay, loss of jobs. Okay. Job yeah, loss. but I mean, what are you talking about? Like, what's the average job loss in a, t- in a typical recession? Like, We've all, the, the thing is that it's always set at the margin, right? So it's like that there are, every time a, every time a uh, tech company sends out a release now, it's to say that they've, they've letting go 5,000 people. Is that up over time? Yeah, but I mean, what are we talking about? So, like, uh, like half a percent of all homes traded a twenty percent discount to where they are today, and then in five years, we're right back here. Like, that's not the craziest. I don't know. Probably. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's like nothing on a on a on a total volume weighted trading basis, right? Like, if on your VWAP, that's like nothing. That's true. Yeah. You don't yeah. So like, a- what the fuck are people talking about? Like as long as as long as you got a locked in mortgage and it's fixed, then I mean, you know, yeah, you're right. A house isn't a trading asset. Correct. If that's the conclusion that people come to, welcome to the uh, party that everybody's been living in. And and if you treated it like a trading asset, then you're gonna find out a duration mismatch from the asset that you own, potentially. But I don't even think that that's really gonna happen if you own good land. But I could be wrong. I'm certainly not very intelligent. You know, one problem could be that if you have, let's say you do have some job loss and you also have, it's really hard to move uh, because of, you know, you're just not going to be able to refinance at a rate that you were at before. Now you're kind of like, that creates a very brittle sort of like social fabric where you have to like look for a job in the same place because God, I can't really afford to move. Uh, That's probably not good. Right. Like, I mean, the problem is rents are, you want those things to be like pretty pliable if you can. Yeah. And rent's crazy right now. There's like bidding wars for rent. Um, So I don't, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think, I think the real bad scenario is an explosion to the upside in housing prices, not the downside. Hmm. Homes only trade five percent of stock per year versus two hundred percent for stocks. It's Keith Smith. I think that's no, interesting. That's not, yeah, I mean, people don't flip their homes. 
I mean, some do, right? But on average, like the home that your wife is raising her children in, you're not going to be like, oh, we caught a bid. Too. Yeah. You take <laughs> out a key. High. Yeah, Back you take out banks, a key. We caught a bid. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're paying the realtor 6%. And like, if you're in Illinois, you're paying a 1% transfer tax and some half percent tax on something else. And Ooh. it's just crazy. So uh, I just, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, but I, I could be wrong. What do I know? There does seem to be, have been a trend of people right. t- taking out the home equity loans and using those to uh, improve their like houses. Bitcoin. <laughs> but there's probably yeah. some of that going on too, to be fair. <laughs> A hundred percent that's going on. And I think, and I think it's a real risk to the economy that I like, I housing slowing is not good. Like, don't get me wrong on that. I just don't know that the outcome manifests itself in a price crash. Now people can say, well, how can you have a huge recession and not have a price crash? I, I just don't know that we have this huge recession over the long term. It seems to me that the problem that we have is we overstimulated the economy. So the conclusion that it can't happen again seems pretty flawed. Unless you say, well, no one's going to accept the paper and how in the world are we ever going to do what we just did? But I think I would have said that in 2020 and I've been disproven. So uh, so you think we, probably, we, we have some sort of hangover from the 2020 stimulus, but they can correct that with more stimulus. And, and because we can't kind of see how they're going to do it, that's not really relevant because we couldn't see how they were going to do it in 2020. And so they'll figure out a way to... Yeah, I, I mean, they obviously overstimulated, but I, I think if we shut down the entire economy and figured out how to avoid complete economic disaster, I, I'm not I'm not that worried about a recession. Now, you don't have the political will, so that's a big change. I mean, I don't see Republicans giving Biden some big stimulus package right now, especially not if you're going into 2024. So that's a big difference. Um, so it could be a problem. Hiking Fed. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know that. Like, I just don't know that the he- that the conclusion that the head is hiking in perpetuity is the right conclusion, right? Not that long ago, it was a cutting Fed in perpetuity. They actually seem like they move. It's a slow, no doubt, but uh, they are moving. I think I saw some stuff this morning on Twitter that they were. In, inflation expectations are still like 8%, which is a very high number. And they're so far behind the curve that they're likely to do another 75 basis points the next time they meet, whenever that is July. Yeah. June 24th, 2019. All right, hang on. 1.861 trillion, I believe, trillion was the uh, taxes that were brought, brought in in... Uh, Withheld income and employment taxes, 1861. And that's 2019. So then if we look at today, year to date, it is, what is this number? Come on now. Oh, crap. I ruined it. I'm sorry. (laughs) Trying to do this on the fly. Uh, Oh, it's quarter three. I always get confused by this stuff because it's not, it's not Q1. All right, so 1861 is what we were looking at in 2019. Today it's 2352. So 2352 divided by 1861 is what are we looking at here? 26% in three years. Yeah, that's not going to keep up with inflation, I don't think. Will it? I don't know. That's 26%. That's the increase in withheld income and employment taxes. Nominal, um, basically, like tax. Yeah, year to date uh, through this year versus 2019. Uh, so that's 20. I mean, you know. It's probably real flat. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. 26% in the last three years, maybe. If you add up. I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good sense, but I, it's not nothing. That I do know. I mean, that's, you know, you're looking at 9% increases per year. We, but, we definitely haven't seen any weakness in the real estate market. I mean, there's, there's like, sorry, the, the, all of the numbers that I see are like the, the, there, there are a few home prices like, were up like 15%. Yeah. Well, they're more like 20, right? Year on year. 21.8 was the number that I saw this morning, year on year. 
but that, well, those those numbers are all delayed three months. They don't give you the, the they don't give you the point in time. So all of the 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 narrative in like Fortune magazine and other stuff like that is that there's a there's a housing bus going on, but it hasn't yet shown up in any of the the numbers, which tend to be a little bit delayed. The Schiller numbers, stuff like that. Hmm. Lennar said that they are seeing weakness in like Seattle and Austin. But uh, I mean, when they talked about their sales incentives, they were talking about like 1.6% of a sales price, which that's not like a huge sales incentive, right? That doesn't imply some crazy, crazy bad thing. Austin, so they said well, yeah, about equity, that's a lot. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's within the realm of history. Like they they said in the conference call, they were like, "This is pretty normal." Um, Austin's been the most impacted market in Texas, following back to back years of forty percent price appreciation. So, Yikes. like, yeah, if we pull back like ten percent, who gives a shit? Still up sixty two percent. Yeah, you know, and Rent's like still too damn high. <clears throat> yeah, uh, while inventory is limited, <laughs> that guy that guy was a visionary. <laughs> <laughs> the rent is he too really high. knew what he's done. What he said higher. Now? They go on to say for that guy. <laughs> they go on to say higher rates in June and headlines on the stock market decline and the distressed national economy have sidelined many buyers who are waiting for a reset in home values. While well, inventory is limited, cancellation rates have increased, and we've reduced prices in many communities on a home by home basis and have offered extremely competitive mortgage programs. Uh these pricing adjustments started to generate increased activity and fundamentally Austin is poised for long-term growth. So that's what they're saying is like in their worst market, the rest of their markets, they're, they're saying are relatively healthy. Why have the home builders all been so beaten up? They don't have volume. Like they're not going to deliver nearly as many homes. Because they're constrained on the, this, the supply side. On the yeah, they're going to protect side. their margins, I think, is what they're saying, and that they're going to pull back construction, which if you have a shortage, is only going to exacerbate the problem. I think the real estate market follows the stock market with about a 12-month delay. Yeah. It just tends to be stickier because the, for the obvious reasons that you can trade much more easily, whereas you, it, takes, it takes a long time to get in and out of a house. I think my conclusions about housing are the, um, the amount of the economic activity that reduced from HELOCs could potentially be uh, reduced, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I guess you got wealth effect. You know, if people think that their houses are worth less than they spend less, that that's a possible follow on effect, but I don't know. Do I'm, people uh, really do that? Do you think? Is oh, it yeah. like a is it like a HELOC thing or is it a my house is my I I've checked Zillow and it's down we've got to con constrain constrain ourselves this month. I think people know roughly what their house is worth. Can we go back to the uh, talking about kind of uh, inflation and value? Yeah, and please. There was a a little table put to, uh, that somebody I don't know where the source came from, but uh, Shy Dardashi, one of my friends uh posted it uh, and it showed the 1973 through 1981 just different asset classes and what did they do on each year and the kagers on them are, are kind of interesting so the first one is on cpi for that time period and you had a nine percent kager during that so cpi was nine percent nine percent year on year 73 to 81 oh. So yeah. that's about, I mean, that's, that's roughly where we are now, right? We've had like a, a year at least of 8%, maybe more than that. Yeah. And what's kind of funny is like you watch it change like 73. So I'm going to go through them just so 6.2, 11.1, 9.1. Then you have three years where it's like five, six, seven, and then 11, 13, 10. So it like, you know, you thought maybe, oh, we're a little bit past this. And then no, it's back with a vengeance for three more years, but nine, 9% on that. So, then against that, you have um, the 10-year treasury uh, did 3.4%. So your real is like a, you know, five and a half percent in the hole. Uh, there you go. This is what I was, that's what I always say about why should bonds yield more than inflation? There's the answer. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Uh, S&P 500 total return, 5.3%. So Ooh. you're 4% real negative. 
Was this for a decade? Uh, oh, no, 73 to 81, sorry. 73 to 81, yeah. Um, value stocks, I don't know how they define that, but did uh, 13.6. So Dang. you had a real real 4.6% return. Uh, NASDAQ, 4.3%. So you mm. were under the S&P, a little bit better than treasuries, obviously negative real. Uh, energy index did 35%. Kager. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the precious metals index did 25% Kager. So wow. interestingly, like we've seen, we've kind of, we in the last year, we've seen energy certainly not put up, I don't know. Well, maybe it is 35% Kager. I don't know. But, um, but definitely precious metals haven't seemed to have kept up with that, no. that analog yet. So I don't know if it's waiting to happen or if it's, not going to happen, but I find that to be a little bit curious. Like that, that's the one thing that isn't rhyming right now. The energy thing is interesting because Buffett seems to be plowing an enormous amount of money into Oxy, just consistently buying big chunks of Oxy. Why is he so concentrated in one? Why not spread it around the complex a little bit more? That's a good question. Mm. Well, you got any ideas? I don't know. Uh, I think it's the biggest in the US, right? Now o- after that Oxy's merger, bigger than Exxon. Well, Exxon's very like global. I'm not sure he wants. I'm not sure he wants all of Exxon. I mean, he and I don't talk, so <laughs> he's not returning my calls right now. <laughs> yeah, but I I just wonder if it's the biggest pure play, and it's it's all in America, so he likes that. Uh, maybe there's reduced reduced political risk there. Are the valuations much different between? Chevron, Exxon, and Oxy? I'm not sure. I don't know what the reserves are. Yeah, you think he's going to bid for the whole thing? Wouldn't shock wouldn't surprise me. me. Or just buy, yeah. just keep on buying until... Yeah, yes. More than 16%, according to Astrid Wild of Oxy. Yeah, I mean, this year's... this. I, I don't know if my estimates are any good, but this year, I guess, $13.5 billion of free cash flow and Oxy is a $56 billion company. Uh, it's, not, it's not a lot of turns. Whereas Exxon is, yeah, $46 billion and a three, $381 billion. So I don't know. Oxy is probably a little cheaper. So the, in that little chart that you were talking about before then, Jake, the, was, it, was it only precious metals? Did they look at like commodities? Did they look at? Anything it just else? said precious metals index. I didn't even have any, you know, details about what that meant. Because commodities look. So this is the thing about commodities. They all look super. The, the companies all look very cheap. They're all on like one year of. I guess that the argument is that that they they've over earned and they're they're yeah, too cheap. cheap as a result. Sorry, they 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 look too cheap as a result, but they're not really too cheap. But then I remember uh, Icon ha- had his run at whatever it was, something at like one time, I think it was US Steel at one times. It was like a one times PE at the time that he bought it, presumably because they thought that was over earning as well. I mean, that's the bet right now, right? Is, uh, is this, how do you normalize? And if the answer of normalization is that it's going to look more like it has in the last year or two, the persistence of it will be longer than everyone expects, then you, you're buying something really cheap. If it goes back to previous periods, then it's not quite as, it's not nearly, it's just optically cheap. Who says gold did well between 1973 and 1981 because it was suppressed until 1971? Yeah, that's probably some something of that. Although you would think once it was let off and when Nixon declared that it would have like just found the right price or pretty quickly but seemed like it each year was kept going up so i don't know yeah but gold has done gold gold is roughly where it was five or ten years ago at the moment it's like 1700 dollars. i haven't looked at it really closely yeah it's like 1850 or something right now in that range it's not certainly not what probably i think a lot of people would have expected if you told me told them nine nine percent cpi prints where's the price of gold <laughs> well the dollar is insanely strong that's true i have seen some charts about like 
gold priced in other currencies and it does look like it's winning uh, more there. So maybe that's the problem is using the dollar. Maybe if yeah. priced in Bitcoin, I bet it looks it's looking pretty strong. Where's Bitcoin today? I should have a look. I don't know, 20,000. <laughs> are you being serious or are you? No, it probably is. Oh, yeah, 20. No, you're right. 20,600. I guess that's about roughly where it's been for the last month. <laughs> are you being oh, serious? No. <laughs> Stop messing with me. Yeah. Okay. 20,600 at the time of recording. Uh, that'll, that'll tell you where, it, when, when you when you listen to this on, on the audio, that'll let you know. That's the timestamp. That's when, how we timestamp. When we, we record it, yeah. So yeah, does gold does gold catch a bid here? Like if, if Bitcoin disappoints, if crypto disappoints, inflation really starts ripping, then uh, it's got to be gold, right? Well, if, I don't if know. Depends on your time the, horizon. So let's call it, uh, if some of the tinfoil hat energy that was being dissipated into Bitcoin <laughs> is finds another outlet, gold is a logical place for them to look. We need to harness that energy. That's a renewable. <laughs> Infinitely renewable energy. <laughs> I, th I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I gold think... in euro terms is quite good. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's right. ripping in euro terms. Yeah. Like like what's it look like over the last year, let's say? Uh up into the right. Oh. I mean strong, it's consolidating a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's consolidating a little bit, but it's it's uh doing well. Really since uh 2018. Hmm. US steals at one times P currently. Ryan Baxter, thank you for that. Yeah, it's cheap. The, the question I mean, the question is whether that's the the, the E is sustainable there. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what happens to steel through something like this. Have to go back and have a look. But I have been. I mean, I've been you, trying to could you make the argument that that long statistical value is short macro, you know, perceived macro insights? Basically, like saying, like I don't know. Nobody knows. Yeah. Who cares? Just buy it cheap. I, I don't yeah. have any, you know, fortune telling abilities. I think it gets you roughly to the. It gets you. You, you miss all of that nuance, but you're 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 focused on buying stuff that's so cheap. Like, yeah, it might not be one times; it might be, it might be three times or five times. In which case, it's, it's probably still too cheap. Is this uh, is this that the uh, bell curve Jedi? Yeah. I'm I'm, <laughs> a, I'm the caved in <laughs> head on the on the far left yeah. side. Oh, are you? I thought you were up at the top of the the bell curve. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Not... screaming furiously about that's it, why that's, that's it. This is not normal. I need to get back to the caved in head side. Need a lobotomy. <laughs> which which coincidentally gets you on the far right hand side too. That's right. Full robe status. Yeah. Uh, Should we do some uh let's some let's do that. Veggied right. up. All right. Let's get after it. Uh, um so I watched uh Tim Ferriss do an interview with Ed Thorpe here not too long ago. Hmm. And uh a recent one? Him, yeah. Or did you just yeah. find it? No, I think it's relatively new. Um, Interesting. He, okay. And what's amazing is when you look at him, you're like, oh, that guy's probably like 65 maybe. But he's he's two years younger than Buffett. He's 89. Like he, wow. and he looks amazing. Like he is killing it. What's uh, the Whatever secret? he's doing. Peanuts and, he he, he peanut talks brittle and about coke. It. No, I, I don't think that was it. Uh, <laughs> Exercise. He, yeah, he's uh, he's like pretty diligent about his exercise his i think he lifts weights still um he talks about it some i think he's whatever he's doing is working for him i don't know if it works for everybody but he's it's working um, i think that's a pretty so, good prescription isn't it lift weights until you can't i think that's probably right i think um peloton <laughs> long peloton <laughs> bill i'll be interviewing you when you're 130 and i'll say what was the secret and you'll say peloton Nah, man, I'm going to be dead long before that, thankfully. Well, the other part of that, though, is I think avoiding stress. And I, Buffett's got that one right. So long Peloton is not avoiding stress. <laughs> Riding it, maybe. It it. There you go. Uh, okay, so and so after watching this in interview, like I've been intending on reading his uh, biography or autobiography, A Man for All Markets, but it inspired me to finally pick it up and read it. And 
was, it was rather enjoyable, although it gets a little meandering at the end where he's he's sort of uh, a little bit of yelling at clouds. You know, old man yells at clouds with these. He like goes into why 2008 crisis was, you know, how it got to, to be such a mess and then how we didn't fix anything. And uh, like, you know, it was kind of a, the typical diatribe that you would hear from I, maybe even one of us, you know, yelling at clouds, <laughs> uh, maybe even me yelling at clouds. Uh, but but in general, it was really interesting to hear all the stories. So I'm going to try to hit some of the highlights of the, the stories. Uh, so uh, as a kid, he was like, he's clearly, you know, he's probably a genius. Like, I don't know what his IQ is, but it's probably up into the genius level. Like he got a PhD in math from UCLA. And, uh, but as a kid, he was just like this relentlessly tinkering little mad scientist. Like he, he, uh, he'd build, you know, his own radios and then have a, uh, you know, he's like, like got his ham license uh, as a, like a little kid, like one of the youngest ever to do it. Uh, and then he's always like messing around, blowing things up. He had this like little workshop in the back of the house where he's like mixing, you know, chemicals that would blow up. And <laughs> and then he somehow he got a hold of this like super, super high concentration dye, like the kind that, you know, like where you're measuring in parts per million type of uh, dye. And he like figured out a way, like he snuck it into the in the public swimming pool and like turned it, it like, you know, like blood red. Uh, nice. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, that so is those... pretty funny. I'd be so pissed if that was my kid though. Uh, a little bit I don't proud. think anybody found out. Yeah. yeah Execution of that. Yeah, exactly. I pooped in a pool once. Does that count? <laughs> uh, no. That okay. Well, not, not, if you, was... not if you were in your thirties at the time, Bill. Yeah, that's fair. It was, was actually it a, yesterday. Was... Was it a baby Ruth or a Snickers? No, it was, it was, but it was a baby pool. So okay. they didn't have to drain too much. Needless uh, to say, my IQ is lower than his. <laughs> so uh, like people would always tell him, you know, something was impossible. And he always, he had this like compulsion to want to check for himself to make sure that that was actually right. So like it, and that started with, you know, you can't win in Vegas. So he wanted to know like, well, is that actually true or not? You can't beat the market. I'm going to figure out if that's true or not. Um, and so he had this sort of mathematical horse sense where he could apply it to where, and, and a very deep scientific understanding where he was pretty good about figuring things out. Like, you know, is it actually true or not? Um, and he was always looking for an edge once he did see if it was true or not and finding that edge and exploiting it and actually like applicably exploiting it, not just, you know, academically, you know, talking about it, like he was doing the real work of like making money from these things. So, uh, you know, when it came to blackjack, which was kind of his first, you know, like sort of big win, he, he devised a very simple card counting system, where it was basically like, you know, as you saw different cards, it would be a plus or a minus, and you just sort of keep a running count. And this was before the days where they had an eight card deck that they were shuffling every two hands, you know, so you got a sense of actually when the edge tipped in your favor, and you, then you varied your betting size. Uh, so, it, you know, he would go to the, the Las Vegas casinos and he'd be disguised, you know, wearing fake beards and like all kinds of stuff to try to keep getting kicked out. Uh, at one point, you know, they brought him a drink and like, you know, he was like loopy, passed out, like they drugged him uh, effectively. Uh, and it happened a few times. Uh, and actually even he had his brakes tampered with. Uh, really? Like, I oh yeah, the casino. Oh, that's so, serious. Whatever. I mean, yeah, no, it was serious. And like, also there was like very, very frequent cheating that would happen with the dealers. Like they would deal like the second card, like they would take, take mm. a peek at it and then second card him. Like and he, he would study with the people who were like these mechanics to learn how were they doing it so that he could see like when it was being done to him. And then he'd be like, well, I'm out of here. Like, it's not like you could do anything about it except just leave. But, um, so in 1966, uh, he wrote Beat the Dealer for a lay audience. Uh, actually, ended up like selling 700,000 copies of it. Like, it's a pretty, pretty big success. Um, and what's another thing that's a little funny piece of trivia is that he wanted to name the book Fortune's Formula. Uh, but then, yeah, but the publisher didn't like it. So they made it call, call it Beat the Dealer. And then, of course, later, uh, William Poundstone, which I have to assume that he named it his book as a nod to Thor Fortune's Formula, which is a great read if you, if you ever get around to it. Um, so then in, in roulette, after he sort of like conquered blackjack, and then of course they made all the countermeasures to, so that he couldn't do it anymore. He found the next game, which he went to roulette and him and he, he was at MIT. This is 1960. Uh, he's, he's studying, he's a professor of math, but he's doing all this stuff, uh, on the side for fun to make money. 
uh, he built the first wearable computer with Claude Shannon, who is the uh, father of information theory, basically. It's Toby's uh, guy. Oh, right? Shannon's a, he's a yeah. beast, right? Yeah. Uh, so they, the two of them went to Vegas with their wives with this wearable computer where it basically had a, a little like toe clicker that would, you could, they try to sync up with the ball uh, as it was being, you know, as the road, as the rotor spinning, they would sync that up. And then with the ball, they like, it would do like a little equation to figure out k- kind of what little section it, the ball was more likely to land in. And so then they would bet according to that. And they actually had an edge, like they were making money in it. Um, and it would play this, it had this little earpiece that would run up and like do a little musical tone to tell you like which quadrant it was going to land in uh, or more likely to land in. Uh, so kind of interesting. Like imagine that's that. dangerous. I wouldn't do that. That sounds like something you could get thrown in jail over in Vegas. It wasn't illegal at the time. Huh. They passed laws later to make it illegal to have anything that helps you like that. Yeah. One of the first uh, wearables. It's incredibly sophisticated, right? He he got he got shocked when he got a drink spilt on him or something like that. Oh, really? I'm sure. I don't. That's funny. <laughs> well, I know that the uh the little like wire that ran up to his ear would like always be like falling off and then <laughs> he couldn't see it and then like I don't like people would be looking at him funny. <laughs> Like, what the hell's going on with this guy? Um, so then, of course, you know, countermeasures for that. And then, uh, so then he, he just got, like, he discovers the stock market and he was looking at options pricing and he basically discovered the, what's, what's now the Black Shoals options formula before Black Shoals had done anything with it. And he was using it as a, as an uh, actual, like, practitioner. And what it gave him a huge advantage because he had a, a much more accurate price for things like warrants and other derivatives. And he could compare that to the underlying and then just basically make market neutral bets all day long on the spreads there. Uh, and the, you know, the markets were much, much more inefficient because at that point, like they didn't really have a good way of measuring these things. Uh, so he'd be, you know, long a warrant and then short the common or vice versa. And so all these different ARBs and he founded this hedge fund called Princeton Newport. And it was like market, market neutral derivatives trading basically before that was a thing. And, um, uh, his main fund ran from 1969 to 1988 and cumulative it put up uh 2734 percent versus the s&p's Oof. like 545 is that good it's good Seems and like good. they only like i think he said he only had like one or two down months even like <laughs> it wasn't like oh this year or this quarter but it was like months where like oh yeah that was a bad the one bad month we had in the last decade <laughs> so just like printing money basically um Next piece, interesting trivia. Summer of 1968, uh, an early Buffett partnership investor who's being kicked out now at this point, right? Buffett's moving on, uh, meets Thorpe and um, asks, basically introduces Thorpe to Buffett so that Buffett can evaluate Thorpe to see like, is this guy the real deal? Like I want to invest with him for one of his previous LPs. So they have dinner together and uh, Buffett tries to impress him with his, uh, he had these non-transitive dice right? Where you let the person pick their pair of dice and then you pick the other one that is like sort of, it's like a rock, paper, scissors kind of thing. Right. And so, you know, Buffett's always winning and people are wondering, how is he winning? Of course, Thorpe figures it out in in no time and, uh, you know, calls him on it. Uh, How was it? So how did he win? uh, I think he just said like, I'm not going to play that game because you're, you're, or let me go second, you know, that kind of thing. You, you pick the dice and I'll go second. Uh, So, and then they get together and, and, and play bridge at Buffett's house uh, in Southern California, uh, which is close to where uh, Thorpe lives. And all, so all this time, and of course that, that investor, this guy named Gerard, he, uh, he, he joins Thorpe. So this guy went from riding Buffett in his heyday to then riding Thorpe through his, like, I don't know how much money this guy ended up with, but talk about, talk about (laughs) hitting a home run on manager selection. (laughs) Um, So of course, you know, Thorpe's like, after meeting him he's like this guy's going to be the richest guy in the world someday i could just like i'm just doing the compounding math in my head and this guy's a, such an animal uh so he keeps like he sort of loses track of him a little bit but then in uh the early 80s he realizes buffett's running berkshire and he sees it and so i think i think thorpe bought a lot of berkshire in 19 like 82 at like 980 dollar class a price and and i think he's held on to it like this whole time uh, so he might have been a you know aside from his own you know selling seven hundred thousand copies of books or you know taking a bunch of money out of Vegas or printing money from derivatives, 
he, he might've made the most money from just throwing money at Buffett and recognizing that he was going to be good for a long time. Uh, and then in 1990, he met Ken Griffin and he, so, and Thorpe was the first LP in the Citadel. Hmm. So maybe that was even more money. I don't know. Like this guy's just got a golden touch. Right. Um, and then last one, 1991, someone asked Thorpe to like, look into this uh, track record and he goes and, you know, it's this stellar performance every month is like, it's up. It's like always winning. And he's like, what the hell's going on here? He looks into it and actually like digs into the trades to try to like, he, he asks his market contacts, like, did these, did this volume even happen that day that it's reported? No, it, it wasn't. And it turns out like, and this is 1991. He, this is Bernie Madoff and he sees wow. that it's, it's fake. And he tells his, the person that asked him to look at it, like, don't go anywhere near that. This is a fraud. And it's not till 2008 that this gets uncovered. So 17 years from when Thorpe knew and even sounded the alarm. Like he, I, I was he talking to somebody him. who said that it was pretty well known that Bernie Madoff was a fraud. And I was surprised to hear that. Uh, that was that it was uh, gave me I was disenchanted by that. But they didn't it was not well known when when Thorpe thought it. But that's amazing. What a fucking career yeah. that guy put together. Yeah. And then he's, I mean, super healthy, had a, you know, wife for 50 years, family man, didn't get all stressed out, didn't try to grow to be too big. I think either that was part of, you know, shutting things down when it got to be too, you know, too much stress or too big and just move on to the next thing. Like uh, what a life well lived and just an incredible investor in winning in so many different places and ways and really knowing what your edge is. And I think I find that to be very inspiring. I have no idea if this is the truth or not, but it seems to me through the stories that you told that he was having fun while doing it too. I think he had a blast the entire yeah. time. Like he was always just trying to solve little problems like puzzles. And he, you know, just this uh, steel trap mind that was applied to these things, like figuring out the, the simple solution, the smart way of doing it. What, how do I have an edge? Uh, yeah. Just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great cool. Story. That's inspiring. Good and veggies, And a little Jake. humbling as to uh, oh, what's what's the edge here? We're looking around. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I say yeah. I should index. I've been humbled. I've been Thorpe's knowing. actually a pretty big advocate of indexing for most people. Yes. I mean, you know, and sprinkle in some other ETFs alongside, but, you know, it's, uh, think, it's not the craziest thing. You actually get to live a life. I think um, Thorpe gave... His Princeton Newport partners got to like two hundred million dollars in assets before he shut it down, and then he gave the the kind of the know how the 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 brains of it to to Citadel. That was That's one right. of the reasons why he invested with them. Yeah, so they had the advantage of his whatever strategy. He, actually, years he in the gave market. them a bunch of data sets that he, only he had too, from different like prices of convertibles and things like that that were not really well. Uh, they weren't well established. I mean, the other thing that actually did happen that was a bit of a downer was um, he had a business part. Like he, so it was Princeton as in New Jersey. So half the operation was there and half was in Newport where he was. And he was sort of like the academic, like, you know, figure out what to do and then send it to New York or New Jersey to put all the trades on. That half of the business got uh, like the SEC and actually it was Giuliani who did it. Uh, at that time, Giuliani came in and was trying to make a name for himself. And he like kicked over a whole bunch of funds, like trying to, and actually it was intended more to squeeze them to try to like get, uh, get at like uh, Michael Milken. Yeah. It was parking, right? They thought they were parking stock for, uh, for takeovers. I mean, they were just looking for anything, right? They, they just came in, they froze everything. They t like subpoenaed every single piece of paper, like basically turned the office inside out. Uh, and so, actually, some of the traders on at Princeton Newport got in trouble, uh, although it's like kind of a question of uh, I think it was insider information that was. But like, I don't know, to me, that seems like a really difficult, uh, like, where's the line on those kind of things? I don't know. But the uh, I think it was more of a political ploy to sort of launch Giuliani, at least according mm -hmm. to Thorpe. Yeah, so he ended up I shutting think. it down because of that, because it was like, all right, this is just too much of a mess. Now I'm going to go take my, take my, uh, couple billion dollars worth of Berkshire stock and <laughs> go live yeah. my rest of my life. See you later. So what does he do? Like he, he stopped 
he, he was, I think he might have been a, he was a professor at UCI, right? Which is down yeah. that way, UC Irvine, math professor at UC Irvine. And then he's run the funds. What did he do when he stopped running the funds? Uh, I think family office, basically, sounds like. I mean, he even did some other kind of interesting things like uh, in the savings and loan crisis, uh, there were these mutuals where if you were a part of that bank, you were eligible to bid for the equity of it when it converted over from a mutual to a stock based uh, uh, institution. And so basically it was like these these little auctions and stuff that where you could go get the stock for. And you, you, he could put a little bit of money in that bank and then go buy a fair amount of the equity at like an underpriced thing, rate. And it would just take time for, so basically it was just a, he knew he was going to make money on it. It was just like, how long was it going to take to make money? And like, I guess even like up until 2014, he still had some that were maturing and he was cashing those checks. <laughs> so hmm. just always, always grinding, I guess. Yeah, that's hmm. a great story. What a great life. Camping. I don't, I don't know where we go from there. I, you know, yeah, take some. I, I think that there's some decent opportunities in corporate credit. Uh, mm. You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, it depends what you, what you want your yield to be, but um, higher. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing. But you know, I mean, I talk about cable a lot, and let's real say you don't positive like, is that a well, let's no. Well, you're not going to get it right now, but let's say that you don't like. Uh, let's say you don't like the equity risk. I mean, you could get, you know, on something like charter, I think the 2033 bonds, uh, firstly and secured, those are yielding five, eight, like that's higher than we've seen in a while. It may not be high enough, but there's other names like that. Um, I don't know. It's kind of interesting for the first time. And, you know, I'm sure there's like way spicier stuff that you can get into. I saw it curates like north of 15 or something like that. On Is it really? Stuff. Wow. Yeah. But again, if you're going to go there, you might as well just get the, yeah, I, and... I tend to uh, prefer a little bit less yield when it comes to credit. I like my spice on the equity side, not the credit side, the credit side. You have a semester asymmetric downside. It's different maths. Yeah. yeah. Just go leaps only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're getting into it. That's almost a little bit of the arbitrage that he was pulling off, that Thorpe was pulling off. Yeah, there's... Um, yep. I don't know. I, I heard someone describe, uh, like, I, I need to hear them re-describe, but what Ackman figured out with some of the CDS, like, there's, there's some... Some of those guys, you get to look across asset class, you see some real opportunities. I am an neophyte, so I do not. One of the things that Thought was doing was when the conglomerates all got busted up, they all had all of this weird, all of these weird securities and paper and equity. And you know, the one of the first things you learn in like finance 101 is that you know you can I, I can't do it off the top of my head, but it's like that the equity equals the you know a put plus a call plus the risk free rate plus it's something like that. And so he was just working out how you could he he. he if you found something representing all of those pieces and you could find an edge in there, you could create a market neutral trade where you made money on, on pieces of it and you took no market risk. Hmm. It was just the dislocation. There might be some of that around. I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's all sort of been arbed out with HFT and so many people doing it. But I guess when you get a dislocation like this, some of it might pop up. I was, uh, I was reading laughing waters, uh, letter the other day and um he said that there's a, a jp morgan stat that like i don't know 80 percent of the market's just mechanical which i think is interesting maybe maybe can give hope to the two percent of people to that are active. true long-term value investors does that mean like Greenwald said that? something similar passive it's passive um, I think mechanical. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know the definitions of passive versus like active with computers, but you know, um, this particular example was citing like a Gix code that was, that misclassified a business. And he's like that 80% awesome. of the investors don't even know what this business is. Right. Cause the Gix, the Gix, Gix code is off. Shout out um, to Matt. He listens to this sometimes he says, there you go. So, you know, hey, Matt. Kinda, yeah. Hello, sir. 
yeah, that's uh, that's that's a little troubling if you believe in price discovery. I mean, it's I believe troubling in liquidity it... and flows in the short term. It's a good thing, right? It creates the opportunity. I'm I'm saying if you're depending on others to tell you what your security is worth. Oh yeah, can't do that. But that's always been the case, right? There's always been. There are lots of reasons why people trade in stocks. I mean, moment, there are momentum traders out there. There are noise traders. There are people looking at symbols in the, you know, they're looking for those up into the bright bag. charts. Scrabble bag, yeah. The scrabble baggers <laughs> too. Scrabble baggers. That's a, that's a, that'd be a good name for the, uh, <laughs> for the Momo who don't, who might be a little less sophisticated. Somebody, somebody tweeted out, uh, Davy Day Trader saying his I'm the captain now. Buffett's washed up. That was that was the top. As Did if that TikTok tip talk it. Uh, as if that wasn't clear at the time. I think Pretty we all kind of knew it, right? It did go on for a lot longer than uh, than I thought it was going to go on for, though, to be fair. Yeah, but to, when you look at it 10 years on, Toby, when you're after it's you true. Know, you've crushed it over the next decade, and you look back <laughs> at this little time period, you go, yeah, I mean, I, I remember that. I, it was kind of hard, but that, that didn't feel like it was that bad. The pain does fade from memory it's pretty like, quickly. That's it's like true. childbirth, right? <laughs> I've heard. I don't, I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think they'd go back again and again. If you if you remember the if you remember the pain of childbirth, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, this is a I, 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 this is a nasty feeling market to me. I, I don't know. I, I, I still feel like we're in the the two thirds. You know, I, I did I did I say this? It was I talking to you uh, before we before we got on. I was just did I say this live when I've been I've been trying to say that uh, the market actually didn't start falling over until. Oh yeah, you said this live. Did I say it live? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to tell these days. <laughs> I'm glad you caught me. Thanks. No, I mean, you could have done it again, but we did hear it. Yeah. I, I mean, dude, I agree. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think we've seen the big wash. I mean, you look at where valuations are. Um, it's not like screamingly cheap stuff out there. You still need, it's still like pretty reasonable. I don't know that we get screamingly cheap. Like we may be in a fundamentally better place than, than we have been in previous sort of crashes, but I don't, you know, if we go a lot lower, I'm not going to be shocked. There's a couple of good uh, top ticks here. So David Wilson says, Arcs Commercial making fun of other styles of investment. Yeah, that was a good one. And Danny yeah. Beltran says, uh, how about the 2021 Twitter thread with all the $5 billion companies that would, I think they were going to become $100 billion companies and there were like 721 of them. Yeah, that was that was. Tough. Didn't someone say that I was like the ultimate effort. short list too? <laughs> they have all been pretty much shredded, those companies, yeah. I'm, I'm very impressed. So like, uh, you know, naked wines is one that I was interested in. I'm impressed with the size of the angel base in that thing, which is like their subscribers. Peloton. Why has been so beaten up? Dude, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I was looking at it the other day. I haven't figured it out. I, I guess there's probably some questions about standstill EBIT is, is probably one of the things, but I, uh, I, I'm not really deep on it. I'm just reading it, but, um, I don't, I don't fully understand that one. I, I think Peloton's like, I'm impressed with what's going on with their business. Like they got problems. Don't get me wrong. They introduced operating leverage at the wrong time, but like their churn rate is still quite good. Their average, their average, uh, like, um, what is it? Workouts per member. It's like 18 a month. Like that's crazy. It's pretty good. Good engagement can't be 18 a month maybe it's a quarter maybe i'm uh, i'm just like it's it, that sounds right 18 a month but like st- every second day that's that's right. people one, are doing one it person every- who rides three times a day yeah well yeah you are skewed for sure by the power users yes and you're also skewed by i suspect that if you do a stretch after a ride they count that as two work because <laughs> if i had to juke stats that's what i would do yeah for sure so yeah so th- that's that's a good point well, Still though, I don't know. I, I thought I thought it would be in a lot worse, like fundamental shape uh, from a user perspective. Forget about the the income statement has problems. I agree. That's time, amigos. We did it. We made it. Peace.
So I think next week is uh, July 4th. I think we'll, we'll take a break for July 4th and then we'll be back uh, the week after that. Yeah, I may be gone a little bit longer, but we'll talk. 